Christopher Bell takes advantage of a couple late race cautions to get the win and advance to the round of eight. Christopher Bell is in. Meanwhile, defending champion Kyle Larson is out. Chase Briscoe, with all of four top fives this year, is in. Meanwhile, rookie Austin Sindrick is out. The playoffs look completely different after a trip to the Charlotte Roval. <laughs> How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. We're talking Charlotte Roval today. Cutoff race for the round of 12. We'll discuss the winner. We'll talk about the top finishers, who's in, who's out of the playoffs. We'll get to all that. But first, I need to establish a couple of basic ground rules. In my opinion, chaotic racing does not necessarily equal good racing. Some chaos is fun, races are long, can be drawn out, so chaos leads to unpredictability, twists and turns. Same reason, you know, major Hollywood movies will have sudden plot twists to keep you interested, to keep you engaged. Some controlled chaos is fine, but in NASCAR especially, there are many examples of chaotic racing going too far. And in my opinion, chaos goes too far when the most dominant driver in car all day gets taken out by a slower driver making a desperate move in the final laps. When any sort of of respect for your competition goes completely out the window when professional race car drivers are broken down into rodeo clowns for us to laugh at. When it renders the previous three hours I just watched utterly worthless, chaos has gone too far. And I think that's what happened today, those final two restarts. This race set itself up as one thing for three hours. Chase Elliott, AJ Allmendinger, the two cars to beat. They had a 13 second lead over the rest of the pack. Larson, Chastain trying to nurse their cars to the finish to advance on points. Briscoe, Sindrick, Bell looking for any sort of Hail Mary opportunities. That was the storyline that we spent three hours building up today. All for the final couple of restarts to throw basically all that in the garbage. Some chaos is fun, don't get me wrong, but I think today's race at the end went too far that path and it hindered my enjoyment. I just wanna establish that baseline first and foremost before we get into all the spicy and juicy details. I'll talk more about the quality of racing, especially for those first three hours at the end of this video when I put this race on the groovy gauge. But for now, I want to begin with those final two restarts. And I wanna start with this. That first caution, the first caution for incident all day long that came with five laps to go, that was the correct call. There was a huge sign inches from the racing group. I was listening to a couple driver scanners, I think it was Larson's scanner, where either the spotter or the crew chief was like, oh, they threw debris for something that was not even close to the racetrack. That's just false. We could all see it on the USA, or I'm sorry, this was on NBC, big NBC. We could all see that big sign laying on the track. At one point, a car running, I think, in the outside, the second groove, all but nipped it with its left side tires. I understand that a big piece of cardboard's probably not gonna end anyone's day, but that is a massive chunk of debris that, yes, justifies a caution. Sure, is it silly that we went without incident all day and a cardboard sign brings out the first yellow. Yes, it's silly, but it's the right call. From there, things got wacky. Christopher Bell, who was lucky to crack the top 10 all day long, chose to pit for fresh tires. Knowing that he had to win this race, anything short of a victory was not going to do him any good playoffs wise. Meanwhile, Austin Sindrick, who was a few points below the cut line, chose to stay out. Gained that track position, gained those few very important points, at least temporarily. Then they restarted and up front, Adrian Elminger just bullied Chase Elliott out of the way. And then he himself got bullied out of the way by Kevin Harvick. Then Tyler Reddick drives into no man's land and takes out Chase Elliott, who'd been the best car driver all day long. Logano, Byron end up spinning on the backstretch chicane. Amidst all this chaos, Christopher Bell with those fresher tires is able to weave his way up into the top five, then the top three, then to second place behind Harvick when another caution comes out, this time for the curb coming up on the backstretch chicane. Ugh, shades of last year's Indy Road Course race, ugh. At this point, Cindric is like plus three or plus four points, not looking too bad as long as Christopher Bell doesn't win the race. Chase Briscoe's just a few points behind him, then Daniel Suarez a few points even further back, just hoping all hell breaks loose. Then we have our final restart with two laps to go. Tons of chaos, guys spinning left and right. Austin Cindric goes spinning through the backstretch chicane, ending his playoff hopes. Christopher Bell with 30 something lap fresher tires than Harvick's able to easily take the lead and drive off and hide. He wins to vault himself from 11th on the playoff grid to second, advancing to the next round. That knocks Cindric out. That also knocks Kyle Larson, the defending champion, 
out. We'll talk more about him in a moment. Chase Briscoe, who like Bell had pit for fresh tires, was able to pass multiple cars in the final laps. He got some help from his teammate Cole Custer on the final lap, sort of brake checking everyone heading into the backstretch chicane. But Briscoe, the man on the mission, ends up snagging the eighth and final transfer spot by two points over Kyle Larson. So let's talk about Kyle Larson for a second. Why was Larson, the defending champ, a two-time winner this year, why was he in such a precarious points position? Well, quite frankly, he made a mistake in stage three, trying to get a little too much, slapped the outside wall, broke the right rear toe link, had to pit, went multiple laps down. This was before the final couple of cautions when things still looked to be pretty okay for him points-wise. The final two chaotic restarts completely took things out of their hands. Larson finds himself below the cut line minus two, and after the race, he... He had no one to blame but himself, saying he made too many mistakes, not just today, but all season long. That's why the five team is out in just the second round. And I think that just about summarizes the final <laughs> two restarts. I definitely missed something. There was too much going on. Here are the top finishers from today's race, but honestly, outside of a couple of names, this is not indicative of who was the fastest throughout the majority of this event. Congratulations, though, to Christopher Bell. Came into this race minus 45. He collected more points than anyone in the round of 16, but 34th at Texas, 17th at Talladega last week. He was in a deep, deep hole today. Needed to win and he got it. Yes, he got some help from some timely cautions, but no NASCAR win is without at least a little bit of luck. Congrats to Christopher Bell. This is the first time, I think, since Matt Kenseth's 2009 Daytona 500 win that sponsored DeWalt was on the hood of a NASCAR Cup Series winning car. I think they were on the side of one of Marcus Ambrose's win, but not on the hood. Not on the hood until today. As a longtime Matt Kenseth fan, I wore the shirt for a reason. Brought a small tear to my eye. The rest of the top finishers, though, Harvick, I mean, he was in the top five late. He ends up second, so I guess that's that's fair. AJ Allmendinger was probably going to finish second to Chase Elliott until the final couple of cautions. He still gets a top five as well. Kyle Busch sneaks in there, though. All of Joe Gibbs Racing had just one top five on any road course this year, and it was actually Christopher Bell back at Coda. Here you got two Gibbs cars finishing the top five, so hey, there you go. A little bit of luck. Great day for Colleague, though. I mentioned Allmendinger, but Justin Haley, he finishes fifth, and he did run top five for large portions of this race. Really great run for Justin Haley. Busher, Bubba, he was blowing chicanes early in the race, comes back to finish inside the top 10. Reddick is still there. He was a contender late. Chase Briscoe finishes ninth to move on to the next round of the playoffs. This round, he finished 10th, 5th, and 9th. Three straight top 10s. <laughs> that, that'll get you through. I'll give Corey LaJoy a shout out finishing 12th. Him and Daniel Suarez, who was, we'll talk about, battling power steering issues the entire second half of this race. Uh, they traded blows in the closing laps and the two were in a heated discussion on pit road and in the garage after the race. I love that NBC caught this moment where you know Suarez and, and LaJoy are clearly jawing back and forth. They're not happy with each other. And a couple little kids come running up to get autographs and kind of interrupt their argument. It, it's kind of funny. I don't know. I'm glad that the cameras caught that one. Those are your top finishers. Now let's discuss the points. Here's how they reset. Moving on, Chase Elliott, Joey Logano, Ross Chastain, Christopher Bell, William Byron, Ryan Blaney, Denny Hamlin, and Chase Briscoe, which means Alex Bowman, of course, Daniel Suarez, Austin Sindrick, and Kyle Larson are the four drivers eliminated today. What went wrong? Well, in the case of Daniel Suarez, he really didn't make any mistakes. He qualified well today. He collected the second most amount of stage points today out of anyone in the field, and it still wasn't enough due to power steering issues. They pitted a couple times late to replace the fluid to try and give him some feeling back in that race car. The poor guy was working hard. Listening to his radio was, was difficult at times in stage three. But it wasn't enough, unfortunately, for Suarez to stay above the cut line. And it's a difficult situation because a lot of these parts and pieces are not built or designed by the race teams themselves. I don't know exactly what went wrong with the whole power steering system, but there's a good chance it was something largely beyond track house racing control. This goes back to like the fire at Darlington that helped knock Harvick out of the playoffs early on. Things that are largely outside the team's control with this spec race car become more and more noticeable when every point matters more late in the playoffs. So really feel for Daniel Suarez. As far as I can tell, neither he nor Trackhouse did anything wrong today. Just bad luck of the draw in the second half of this race knocked them below the cut line. I mean, you can always look back at the other two races in this round and say, you could have done this, done better at Talladega, could have done better at Texas, sure. But plus 12, coming in, then collecting 13 stage points, they played this pretty much perfectly until the car just betrayed them. 
Not much else to say there. Daniel Suarez has every right to be frustrated with how this race ended. Trackhouse as a team, as far as I can tell, every right to be frustrated with how their 99 car season ended today, but that's what happened to Daniel Suarez. Kyle Larson, I already hit on this a little bit, kind of the opposite. Larson made a mistake today. Nothing broke on his car until he smacked the outside wall. He owned it in his post-race interview. The truth is, this was not a spotless round for Larson, and Unlike last year when he had, I don't know, seven, eight wins by this time, he only has two wins this year, not nearly as many playoff points at his disposal. Ninth at Texas, not bad. 18th at Talladega, okay. And then today, 35th. That's what he was credited with. You finish 35th late in the playoffs, you're probably not moving on. That's just the truth. Late in the season like this, you can't have a catastrophic race like this one, and you especially can't have two or three imperfect races in a row if you want to advance to the round of eight. It's, it's really hard to overcome those kinds of finishes. In the case of Austin Sendrick, he had even less playoff points than Larson to work with, and he was 15th at Texas, 9th at Talladega, okay, a little bit better, but he gets scored 21st here today. Again, he was trending good until he spun out there in the final uh, two laps on that final restart, so it became a game of inches for Austin Sendrick, but honestly, rookie year to win a race, Daytona 500 of all races, to make it to the round of 12 and be this close to the round of eight, which I think they mentioned this on the broadcast, a rookie has never made it to the round of eight since this kind of format was implemented. A lot to be proud of, a lot to work with. I know he's very disappointed and very frustrated with how that final lap went, but all things considered, still a very successful season for Austin Sendrick, but a painful way to go out. Bowman, we know how he's out. He's missed the last two races due to a head injury. Hopefully he's able to return sometime soon, but he's out of the playoffs. Larson, Sendrick, Suarez, and Bowman, your four drivers eliminated in the round of 12. One more look at the eight drivers moving on and how the points will reset. Chase Elliott, your regular season champion, once again rockets to the top of the board. It's interesting though, Christopher Bell, we talked about this a few weeks ago with how he was running in the first round of these playoffs. He looked like a legitimate championship contender. Two straight weeks in this round with struggles, with issues. His playoffs were in jeopardy, but a win today, and suddenly Bell is back in the championship four picture. Right now, he is fourth. If the championship four began the next week, he would be in it. So exciting times to be a Christopher Bell fan. He's been the most consistent Joe Gibbs racing driver all season long, and now he's coming through in the clutch, getting to victory lane when he needs to most. So uh, there's how your final eight stack up. Uh, Chase Briscoe, what a guy. I mentioned it jokingly at the very beginning, but he does only have four top fives this year. The regular season matters, but if you do well, if you're consistent late in the season, you can make up for a less than perfect regular season. And Chase Briscoe, all three races in this round finished inside the top 10, did what he had to do. Just enough to squeak by. That's, I mean, that's a cool story. Good for him. I'm excited for the next round of the playoffs, specifically the next two weeks, because it'll be two mile and a halfs. Las Vegas, and arguably the best mile and a half in NASCAR, Homestead, Miami. Wow, can you imagine two, three, even one year ago, me saying, wow, I can't wait for the mile and a halfs in a round with Martinsville in it. No, I'm more looking forward to Homestead, Las Vegas, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Today at the Charlotte Roval, the next gen car got exposed once again. It has been a rough couple of months for NASCAR when it comes to issues being brought to light. First with the safety stuff, rear impacts knocking Kurt Busch and Alex Bowman out of playoff races due to head injuries. Then it was the reliability of the new car with you know, Kevin Harvick catching on fire at Darlington. We've seen some power steering issues in recent weeks. Business issues came to light this week when the teams came out and publicly said, hey, the NASCAR business model is broken. And then today, in case we need another reminder, this new car does not race well on short tracks and road courses. Not not as well as the previous car did. And when I say it doesn't race as well, I mean, it's just not as fun to watch. The cars in many ways are built for the short tracks and road courses and that there's higher corner speeds, there's more grip. This thing handles more like a sports car on the road courses, which is great for you know, faster lap times. But when it comes to watching the race as a fan or even competing as a driver, it's just not as fun, flat and simple. The first two and a half stage, uh, the first three hours of this race were not fun to watch. They just weren't. After the first lap or so, there was virtually no passing anywhere in the field. I saw one pass for the lead under green, and I think it came in early stage three when uh, Allmendinger got by Redick, I believe. And it kind of looked like Redick or whoever it was he was battling with just let him go. Dale Earnhardt Jr. said it best on the NBC broadcast. Once they got single file, passing was non-existent. NASCAR cannot roll out this exact same rules package next season. Not at the short tracks and road courses. They need to make some changes. Whether it's as simple as just add horsepower back. You know, last year at the Roval, they had 750. This year, they're at like 670. So 
Add an extra 100 horsepower, maybe that's the fix. Take the rear diffuser off, I don't know. Change the tire combination, work with Goodyear. You're probably not gonna make the tire narrower. I, I highly doubt something that major is possible to be adjusted before next season. But whatever you can possibly work on, work on it. I know NASCAR has a lot on their plate right now, but this is another big one, unfortunately. I think I saw uh, Matt Weaver, reporter Matt Weaver, tweet at some point during the race, but all the hype around bringing North Wilkesboro Speedway back next year, cup cars racing at the historic short track for the all-star race, all the buzz, all the hype will all be for naught if the racing product sucks. Imagine if North Wilkesboro's all-star race next year looks like Martinsville did this past April. That would be hugely deflating. I think we'd all agree. The first two and a half, three hours of today's race was some of the most uninteresting, most non-competitive road course racing I've ever seen in NASCAR history. Suarez trying to battle his car, then you know Chastain hitting the outside, while some of the attrition towards the end kept me mildly interested, but there just wasn't enough happening. It, it felt like a Formula One race, and I don't mean that to be you know, too derogatory. At least Formula One races are you know no more than an hour and a half long. This race was nearly three hours of nothing. I hope and pray that NASCAR and the teams are able to work out some edit to this rules package and they don't trot out the exact same thing next year. We're gonna have to sit through Martinsville in a couple weeks. I'm not really looking forward to that one, but by 2023, can we please make some major modifications? Just up the horsepower. That might be the quickest and simplest partial fix. <sighs> we'll see. Let's put this thing on the groovy gauge and let's get out of here. While the end of the race was way more entertaining, way more engaging, it crossed over into being too much chaos. So I'm going to give this race, I'm sorry, a, a 40%. This is one of the few sub 50 scores I've given this year. 40% for the Charlotte Roval, easily the worst Roval race in its short, but memorable history. I'll be curious to know what you guys think down in the comments below. It just leaves a bad taste in my mouth when we spend three long, slow hours setting up one set of storylines only for the script to be completely thrown out in the final you know, 20 minutes. I love a little unpredictability, but this is an example of the payoff just not hitting. And I'm happy Christopher Bell won. I think that's a great story. Bell coming through in the clutch to advance to the final eight where I think he's a legit championship contender. That's a great story. And it still didn't hit right. At least not for me. Forget about all the other crazy shenanigans that happened in the final couple of restarts. I expect a little bit of chaos with my NASCAR Roval race, but I don't expect it all to hit at once after three hours of nothing. This is a tough race to put into words. I've done my best. I wanna hear what you guys can do in the comments section below. Leave a comment. Let me know what you thought of today's Bank of America Roval 400. How you feel about Christopher Bell nabbing the victory, the eight drivers who moved on, the four who were eliminated, any surprises? <laughs> yeah, there are a couple for sure. Share your thoughts down in the comment section below, but that is gonna do it. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss any future content. Got some exciting things to announce in the coming days and weeks. Weeks. And as always, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters as well. We will be back this week. Lots to talk about before Las Vegas next Sunday. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Take it easy, y'all.